Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Evening Bible Study. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter number 23. We're going to be looking at what is said about the seven feasts of the Lord in this chapter. While you're getting your Bibles and turning there, I'll answer that weekly question, what's God done in your life this past week that's been a blessing to you that you could share with someone? And this last Sunday was another one of our potluck Sundays. Uh, we've decided that we're going to have one once a month this year. And last Sunday was the time for the month of March. And uh, it was another good lunch. And uh, Baptists really enjoy potlucks. And uh, I fit right in that. And so it was a good time. We had a good turnout. And uh, so it was a good Sunday. And uh, when we have the potlucks, uh, the people get kind of the rest of the day off. We don't have an evening service that night or an afternoon Bible study. Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to Leviticus chapter number 23. We'll get started and we'll look at all the verses in this particular chapter instead of looking at highlights like we did last week. I'll begin in reading verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. So a couple of things that we want to consider after these first two verses. At the end of verse 2, he said, these are my feasts. So these are not just feasts that were <clears throat> given to the nation of Israel for, for them to say they were their feast. God wanted them to understand they were his feasts. And because of that, they're very important. They were important historically. They were important prophetically. And we'll be talking about some of that uh, in each of these as we go through. The word feasts there comes from a Hebrew word, I think pronounced moed. And it means an appointed time. And then where it says, uh, which you shall proclaim to be a holy convocation. This word convocation comes from a Hebrew word mikra, which means a rehearsal. So we could understand that these feasts are at appointed times a, on a regular basis each year on their calendar, and they served as rehearsals. Well, they serve as rehearsals because every time that they observed one of these things, they were acting out or being involved in what we could consider to be an object lesson that had a spiritual meaning to it that Christ will fulfill. And we'll see how that he fulfilled the first four of those seven at his first coming, which then leads Bible scholars to believe that Christ will fulfill the spiritual meaning of the last three feasts when he comes the second time. So now we'll look at verse number three. This has to do with the Sabbath. It's not one of the seven feasts, but it's put in here. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. One of the thoughts about this is that observing the Sabbath was also one of the Ten Commandments given by Moses or given to God, from God to Moses, to the people in the 20th chapter of Exodus. In fact, it was the fourth commandment that they would observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And interestingly, that's the only one of the Ten Commandments that we don't find reiterated or reviewed or given as instruction for the New Testament church. We do find in the various writings in the New Testament, whether they're in the Gospels or the Epistles, a support of all of the other nine commandments, not to kill, not to take the name of the Lord in vain, and not to lie and not to covet and all those things. But we don't find the instruction in the New Testament church after the beginning of the church age to observe the Sabbath. Something else that we might remind ourselves of is that these particular feasts 
were part of the Mosaic Law. And the Mosaic Law was given to the nation of Israel. It was not given to any Gentile nations. The only time Gentiles would be involved and required to follow these would be if they were Jewish proselytes, or in some instances, if they had become indentured servants or slaves to a family of Israelites. So we'll move now to verse number four. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. In a Jewish calendar, in a Jewish week, there's always the weekly Sabbath. It's always the seventh day of the week. It's always from sundown Friday night until sundown, or here it's referred to as twilight, on Saturday night. So basically Saturday from, from the evening of Friday after the sun goes down until the sun goes down on Saturday would be considered the weekly Sabbath. When we would come to a particular month or a date of the month on the Jewish calendar where one of these feast days would occur, they would be considered as high holy days. So they would also be treated like a Sabbath day. So the first two that are mentioned here that we find in verses four through eight, the first one is Passover. The second one is unleavened bread. What we're going to see is that this is a list of the particular uh, feasts, if I can get that where you can see them all. It begins at the top with uh, Passover on the 14th day of Nisan. And you'll see over on the right-hand side that I looked on the Jewish calendar for this year, 2024, and that particular date falls on our 22nd day of April. This is one of those years where what people normally refer to as Easter, and I refer to it as first fruits, comes on the last Sunday of the month of March. It's one of those times where what people refer to as Easter and Passover or first fruits doesn't happen at the same time. And that's the reason for that is quite a long explanation that we don't have time for today. Maybe sometime down the road, we'll go over the reasonings for that. But the interesting thing is that the Passover celebration, the Feast of Passover, always happens on the 14th day of Nisan. That was given to uh, Moses in uh, Exodus as it would become the head of the months or the head of the year, the first month of their religious calendar year. They have on a Jewish calendar, basically two calendars in one. There's a civil calendar and there is a religious calendar and they're exactly six months apart. So that the first month of the religious calendar, Nisan, is the seventh month of their civic calendar. And the first month of their civic calendar, which is Tishri, is the seventh month of their religious calendar. And then just to make things a little bit more confusing, about three or four years ago, there were several men who have been studying for quite some time the Dead Sea Scrolls and the writings of the early church fathers. And they came up with, with what's referred to as an Essene calendar or sometimes referred to as the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. And it is a solar calendar that has 364 days in it. And so every three or four years, they will add a leap week. For our Gregorian calendar, this year, 2024, happens to be a leap year. 
So we add one day every four years to our calendar on the 29th of February. And we did that last month. The, the uh, Hebrew calendar that this was based upon is a lunar calendar. And it has, instead of a leap day or a leap week, ever so many years, they will add an extra month. So they will have two of the 12th months in a row. I know that's a little bit confusing, but what we want to understand from this is that on this particular uh, list of these uh, dates for these feasts in this particular year, uh, on the 14th of Nisan, that falls on April 22nd for our calendar. And unleavened bread is the very next day, which be the 15th of Nisan, and that would be on the 23rd. What we don't see yet, we'll get to it in just a moment, is this Feast of First Fruits. Something else that I would explain a little bit while I've got this up there is that you'll see that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles are underlined. Those are referred to sometimes as pilgrim feasts because there was a requirement in the Mosaic Law that for those particular feasts, all able-bodied Jewish men, even if they lived in some other country, were supposed to migrate or pilgrim to Jerusalem to observe those particular feasts in Jerusalem. And so, for example, that's why there were so many people that spoke so many different languages in Jerusalem at the Feast of uh, Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and the apostles and the people in the upper room began to miraculously be able to share the gospel message in languages that they had not previously known. And it astounded the people that were there because they heard the words of life in their own native tongue. So that's a, just a side note, I guess. So now we'll come back to our text and we'll begin reading again at this verse number four. Look at this Passover and unleavened bread and then we'll make some comments. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So the historical importance, historical, <laughs> that's not to be confused with hysterical. The historical <laughs> importance of this was that it uh, commemorated the exodus from Egypt, when God had Moses finally after the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn in Egypt, then Pharaoh allowed the Israelites to leave and they left. And that, so that was on Passover. And <clears throat> remember that the name Passover came from the fact that they were to select a Passover lamb on the 10th of Nisan, keep it, make sure it had no blemishes on it, no broken bones or anything that would uh, cause it to not be a satisfactory Passover uh, sacrifice. And then on the 14th, they were to kill it and to put some of the blood on each of the doorposts and across the lintel. And that night when the death angel passed through Egypt, when he saw the blood on the door, he would pass over that house and the firstborn in that house would not die. And so it was referred to as Passover. And so they were to keep observance of this for all of their generations. And historically, it caused them to look back and to think about the very first Passover and how God uh, rescued them and freed them and took them out of slavery in Egypt and took them on their way to the Promised Land. The, the uh, prophetic importance of that was that Jesus fulfilled the spiritual meaning of that in that he was crucified on the cross on Passover. And my opinion is that at the moment the Bible says that he gave up his spirit, 
was the very time in the afternoon when the high priest would have sacrificed the Passover lamb at the altar in the temple courtyard. So unleavened bread began the very next day. So basically unleavened bread lasted for a week. And so when people, and that was one that they were supposed to be there. So people would come so that they could be there in time to celebrate Passover. And they then would stay for the next seven days to celebrate and uh, to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. And so the uh, historical significance of that was that the people left it, uh, Egypt in such a, uh, a quick manner that they had no ability to have uh, sourdough preparation made to take with them. And so they ate unleavened bread for seven days. And so that was the instruction for the people from generation to generation when it was time to observe Passover and the very next day they would observe unleavened bread for a week. And that was to commemorate the fact that they were not to have any leaven in their house. And uh, so prophetically that was fulfilled, the spiritual significance of it by Christ when he was buried on unleavened bread and leaven causes dough to rise because of the decaying process, the fermentation process, and causes it to rise. But Christ fulfilled that spiritual significance of there not being any leaven in the bread in that his body did not decay at all while it was three days in the grave. So he fulfilled Passover by, by being crucified on Passover. He fulfilled unleavened bread in the fact that he was buried on unleavened bread and for three days there was no decay to his body. So now we come to verse number <clears throat> 9 through 14. And this talks about first fruits. And we'll notice something different about this in uh, verse number 10. I'll start reading in verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and here comes verse 10. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land, referring to the promised land, which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread, nor parched grain, nor fresh grain, until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation in all your dwellings. So the historical importance of this was, they didn't observe this particular feast while they were in the wilderness wanderings, but when they got into the promised land and ate of the harvest that first spring that they were into the promised land, not only did they observe that, manna also stopped appearing for them each day at that point in time. And they were to then bring a wave offering of the first ripe shocks of grain, which would have been the barley harvest, which gets ripe before the wheat does. They would bring that to the priest and he would wave it before the Lord. And they would give that first of their uh, harvest to God, signifying that they had faith that he would bless them with an even greater harvest to come. The prophetical uh, implication of that was that Jesus fulfilled the spiritual significance of this when he was raised from the dead on first fruits. First fruits would be the first Sunday or the first first day of the week after Passover. And so uh, regardless of what day you believe that Jesus was crucified, whether Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, he was raised from the dead sometime after dark on Saturday night because when the women went there on Sunday morning, he was already raised and out of the grave. And so he fulfilled first fruits by being the first one to be raised from the dead and to receive a glorified body. And he's referred to by the Apostle Paul as our first fruits. The next one will be the Feast of Weeks. That's what it's referred to here in the Old Testament. 
In the New Testament, it's referred to as Pentecost. Penta meaning five or 50. And so it's 50 days after first fruits. So I'll begin reading in verse 15. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, which would have been first fruits after the weekly Sabbath. From the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed, which would be 49 days. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. That means they won't be put on the altar because they were never to put leaven or honey on the altar, but they would be waved before the Lord. They are the first fruits to the Lord, and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offering, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of a peace offering. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning that, that they might drop. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. If you recall the story of Ruth and Boaz, she, uh, by God's providence, uh, went to glean uh, grain for she and her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she ended up in Boaz's field. And uh, so that's the story <clears throat> about Ruth and Boaz. And what he was doing was having his uh, servants, if they dropped anything, leave it for not only uh, Ruth, but other poor people that would have been in his field to come by. And it was their form of welfare, but it wasn't mailed to them or given to them. They were able to get it free of charge, but they had to go work to get it. So the historical importance of this is that tradition says that this was also the day that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses up on Mount Sinai. And the prophetical at that time, which has been fulfilled now by Christ at his first coming, was him sending the Holy Spirit to come at the Feast of Weeks or on Pentecost. Also something of interest if you recall the story of when Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he came down and the people had made Aaron make a golden calf and they were dancing and worshiping the golden calf and getting involved in all type of immorality. <clears throat> there were 3,000 people that were put to death that day. Interestingly, and I don't think it's a coincidence or an accident, on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament, the gospel tells us that on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 people who were saved and baptized and added to the newly formed New Testament church. Quite interesting. The letter of the law kills. The spirit gives life. Isn't that amazing? Now we'll come to verse 23 through 25 and look at the Feast of Trumpets. And this will be the first of those fall feasts. Uh, the fall feasts are down here. So there's trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. So... There are four feasts in the spring, three of them in the early spring, uh, one 50 days later in late spring, Pentecost. And then in the seventh month, in the fall, there are the last three feasts. So the Feast of Trumpets, beginning in verse 23, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So the historical importance of this is, on the first day of this seventh month, which is the month Tishri on the Jewish calendar, that was their, their civil New Year's. That would be like their New Year's Day. But it also, on their religious calendar, was this Feast of Trumpets. On the seventh month of the religious calendar, the same as the first month on their civic calendar. So since Jesus physically 
fulfill the spiritual significance and meaning of those first four feasts at his first coming. Many Bible scholars believe that Jesus will fulfill, will fulfill the spiritual significance and meaning of the last three fall feasts at his second coming. And so there are some commentators that speculate that the rapture will happen on the Feast of Trumpets. And there's quite a bit of controversy over these speculations. Uh, it seems that to me that takes away the teaching that the Bible gives us as an imminent return of Christ at the rapture. Imminent meaning could happen at any moment. It could be the very next thing on God's timetable. There are no signs uh, given for us to know when it will happen. It's like Jesus taught in many of his parables that as servants, we are to watch and be waiting and prepared for the master's return. So there are some people that try to reconcile that. Remember that Jesus also said, no man knows the day nor the hour, but my father in heaven. And so the people that think that the rapture of the New Testament church will happen on the Feast of Trumpets try to reconcile that by the fact that the Feast of Trumpets is the only one of the seven feasts that begins with a new moon. The new moon is the very first time you see a sliver of the moon after there's not been a moon in the sky for a few days. And it was very hard to detect. And so because of that, Tradition says that the Jewish people would observe that particular feast for two days in a row just to make sure that they got it on the right day of when the first uh, new moon was detected. And so they say that since they don't know if it was this day or that day and they observe it by two days, that that fulfills the requirement that no man knows the day nor the hour. But for me, my opinion is that it takes away from the biblical teaching of the imminence of the rapture of the church. There's other commentators that say that the feasts, these seven feasts, are given directly and only to the nation of Israel, which would not be given directly to the New Testament church, which in our day is predominantly Gentile. Although when it first began at Pentecost, it was probably 100% Jewish. But now we understand that it's predominantly Gentile in nature. And so many commentators, and I have a tendency to agree with that particular group, believe that the rapture won't happen on one of the feast days because those were given to the nation of Israel. But nobody knows. And so it's okay to speculate and to, to talk about it and debate it. And only time will tell. So we move now to verse 26 and the Day of Atonement. This is the only day of the year where only one person, the high priest, was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies beyond that second veil to sprinkle blood before the mercy seat that was above the Ark of the Covenant for the atonement or the covering of his sins and the sins of the people. Verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month, so Feast of Trumpets on the first day of Tishri, Day of Atonement is on the tenth day of Tishri. Also on the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls. This is the only one of the feasts that were that wasn't to be a, a joyous occasion and uh, like what you would expect from a feast, but they were to afflict their souls. And some tradition says that that meant that they were to fast and not even eat or drink anything uh, for a period of uh, 24 hours. I don't know if that's true, but that's what tradition says. He said, you shall do no work on that day, for it's the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. Atonement means covering. Remember, when we get into the New Testament, we are told that the blood of Christ is a propitiation, not just an atonement. It's not just a covering. It's a propitiation, which actually takes away or cleanses us from our sins. So, it says, any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among the people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. In all your dwellings, it shall be for you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the morning at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. 
So historically, this was the day that the high priest was able to enter into the Holy of Holies, the sprinkle of blood before the mercy seat. So the significance for it in our day is that when Christ died on the cross, that veil was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that because of and through the blood of Christ, anyone who is a Christ believer and follower can enter into the very presence of God by prayer. So commentators say that uh, Jewish people believe that the prophetical implications are that the Messiah will come and cleanse Israel and restore Israel uh, to the head of nations again uh, when he comes. That's the belief of the Orthodox Israelites. And so Yom Kippur is this day of atonement. It's the way it's uh, given nomenclature on our calendars today. So what they would see then in their belief that that would be when the Messiah comes to restore Israel would be like what we believe takes place in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation when Jesus comes back to defeat his enemies and restore Israel to a, a nation of prominence. The last one is the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll begin reading at verse 33. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day shall there be a holy convocation. And it goes on through these uh, particular verses that I won't read for the sake of time. But the historical significance of this was it commemorated the remembering of how the nation of Israel didn't live in permanent dwellings, but they lived in tents or booths uh, all during that 40 year period that they wandered through the wilderness. And so once a year, the people were to make booths uh, in their backyard or someplace around their home and eat their meals and live in that little booth uh, for that particular week. And uh, then prophetically, it's, I believe, pointing to when Jesus will come back after Revelation chapter 19, will make preparations to uh, set up his kingdom, and then the kingdom will begin, and he will then tabernacle among the people. And we will even continue to observe the Feast of Tabernacles all throughout that 1,000-year millennial kingdom reign. We learn that from the book of Ezekiel. So there's a kind of elongated quick view <laughs> of the seven feasts of the Lord, plus the Sabbath that was mentioned at the beginning of it. Next week, we'll be in chapter 24 and following in the book of Leviticus. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word that we can look at it and understand the spiritual implications, the prophetical implications, the historical importance of these particular feasts of the Lord, how that they are all fulfilled by Jesus Christ, either in his first coming or we believe in his second coming. Thank you for those who join us online. We ask for your blessings on them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope to see you tomorrow morning and Thursday Bible Life today. Have a good evening. Lord bless you.